So if we have higher signal, we can get improved resolution. The problem is that with lower, with lower free, uh, wavelength, we have more fluorescence. So we can go to near-infrared lasers, the 1064, but then the signal it reduces, OK? It's, how, it's, it's, it's a relationship of 1 over the wavelength to the power of 4, the intensity. So there's a big reduction in the signal as we move to higher wavelength. Um, let me see here. So before I go, but there's things that we can do. And well, Renato is, is working on this. There's a technology that is called SIRS. And we take advantage of a surface plasmon effect that we're going to have with Raman. So if we have gold or silver uh, substrate, and if we interact that with our sample and we'll have the, the Raman effect, we increase the signal. There's some estimates that you can increase your signal 10 to a 9 to 10, 10 to a 12. So by using SERS, I think that that's the technology that is going to be very interesting for Raman. Because I work with food. We have a lot of problems with Raman experiments because of fluorescence from food components. Uh, so mean infrared, we're going to get fundamental vibrations. Mean infrared is very, it's a good technique, but you're going to be giving up sensitivity. Okay, you're looking at overtones, combination bands. We're going to look at less information, uh, usually broader bands, so you don't have the detail that you have with the fundamental vibrations. And then we have Raman. One of the nice things with Raman is that it's a complementary uh, technique with mid infrared. So molecules that absorb poorly in the mean infrared absorb strongly in the Raman and vice versa. Molecules that have poor signal with Raman, they are going to have a strong signal with mean infrared. So actually, if we can combine both technologies, we're going to have much better tools. Um, so for example, we're going to have Strong dipole uh, uh, vibrations are going to be OH and H and CO. We can see these vibrations with mean infrared. With Raman, we're going to get more of the vibrations with this alkene, the CN types of vibrations, and aromatics. Okay? So we're, we can use both systems and get complementary uh, information. One really nice advantage of Raman is that it's not affected by water. So you can actually look at, at liquid samples. And because you don't have the OH, or it's minimal, the OH signal, you're not going to have much influence in your spectra from water. So that, that's a big plus with Raman spectroscopy. Another thing is that um, you can actually make measurements through plastic, through glass, and get information on the samples. Uh, so Raman's really nice for diluted uh, samples with water. You can use it through transparent com containers, pressure sensitive substances. FTIR, much better with dark color, fluorescent samples. We don't see fluorescence. It's not affected by fluorescence, and we get strong signal. And there's a lot of opportunities by combining both. Uh, and, and I think that this is, this is a powerful combination of technologies. Now, we cannot see gases. We cannot see metals, so that's where Edenir has an advantage with ICPMS. We don't see metals at all, unless they're complex. If we have complex metals, like copper sulfates, we're going to be able to get a response, but not just the metals. So 
uh, salt, we cannot see salt. Uh, we cannot see, well, there's some ways that we can see sodium chloride, but sodium chloride by itself doesn't have a dipole. And if it doesn't have a dipole, doesn't have an IR signal. But one characteristic of salt is that it binds water. So according to the amount of salt that we have dissolved in water, the band for water changes. We have a shift in the mid or near infrared associated with salt. So we can, we can get actual information about sodium chloride. Uh, chemometrics, very important for near infrared or mid infrared because the spectra is going to have a lot of information, but most of that information is going to be masked. And we need to use some mathematical treatments and we need to use statistical analysis to allow us to extract some of the, this information from a very convoluted data set. So chemometrics is something that is very important. Unless you have, with few samples like trans fat, that you have a specific band associated with the trans fat, we're, we, we rely on chemometrics for this type of analysis. So we can do two types of experiments. We can do classification and we can do quantification. So by using the spectra, we can see natural clustering of our samples or we can actually do a regression and quantify the levels of a specific compound that is present in your sample. Um, most of the near infrared systems that are associated with food science are systems that are developed to measure major components, okay? Fat, protein, water, okay? There's some of them that are going to be giving you information about lactose. There's some of them that are going to give you information about starches but most of them are going to be uh, major components in your foods. My research is mainly about minor components in foods. So that's why in my lab, we mainly work with Fourier transform infrared. Fourier transform infrared, either the near infrared or the mean infrared, is going to allow us to have a much more reliable signal, and with a more reliable and precise signal, higher intensities, we're going to be able to be much more accurate in our predictions. Um, so classification methods, we can have unsupervised or supervised. Unsupervised is when we don't know information about the natural classification of your samples. So typical from unsupervised is going to be PCA, principal component analysis, that we're going to just see how our samples are uh, being clustered without previous knowledge. Now, supervised is more powerful, but with supervised, we need to know prior to our analysis the classes for, for which our samples belong. So for example, if I'm classifying juices, I need to know if they are coming from, if they are coming from um, what? Mango, maracuja, abacashi. We need to know exactly where these juices are coming to give that information. We're going to give a specific class to each one of these juices. Now, if we do that, then we're going to be able to predict an unknown sample. So, and the supervised type of approaches is going to allow us to predict unknown samples if they fall within those classes. Um, there are different types of uh, supervised analysis. The ones that we do in our lab is called SIMCA. Some others that are um, 
that you're going to see in the literature is the linear discriminate analysis. We're go we have the, um, the DPLS, the neural networks. Uh, there's another one that is called genetic algorithms. Uh, but the one that we use the most is Simca. And we use Simca because it will allow us to classify our samples and it will develop this 95% cluster. Okay? Those white dotted uh, signal that you see surrounding my samples is a 95% confidence interval determined statistically. So any sample that I run from an unknown set, we don't know the identity of that sample, and it falls in any of these clusters, is going to be given that identification. So it's a really nice way to predict unknown samples. Um, so it's simple and efficient. You, we can run Simca, um, well, depending on the, on the software, but we use Pirouette in our lab. We can run Simca very quickly. It's a very efficient, very fast software that is going to allow us to get information from the, the, the clustering of our samples. Allows to find and exclude outliers. Outliers are very important to identify. A spectral data, you collect spectra very fast. Okay? One sample can be collected in about a minute. The problem is that if you don't clean your, uh, your sample well, if by any chance you, have, you didn't do a good sample prep or you have a contaminated sample, you want to be aware of any potential outliers. And this software is going to allow you to identify those outliers. So this is very powerful, allows to compare models for each class and allows to arrange a sample to several classes. So lots of advantages of Simca. There's many options with, uh, with a supervised analysis for chemometrics. If you're working in a spectral analysis, there are very few. PLS or PCR, and most of the analysis for regression is done with PLS because uh, PLS is a method that is going to be using both your spectra and your reference value, okay? So for each spectra that you collect, you have a reference value associated with that. Let's say if you're doing protein, you have a spectra, you have a value of protein for that sample that you collected the spectra, and so on. Okay? We develop models with more than 50 samples. So we're going to have a big matrix of data sets. Actually, some of, our sam uh, some of our models are developed with 200. We have one with 700 spectra that we're developing. Um, the overall objective is to maximize the covariance between X and Y. So PLS, what it does, is going to be determining the scores and loadings by using X and Y at the same time. So it's very powerful and it, it allows us to determine sources of variance that is explaining that correlation with the fewest numbers of factors. So what are the things that we're investigating? And we had a workshop. We have been talking a lot of other things. I'm going to narrow to a few examples within uh, those topics. But my, my main interests are quality assurance. We're working a lot with the industry on opportunities for quality assurance, uh, monitoring quality traits, authentication, adulteration, uh, and in the food safety. We're working a lot with chemical contamination and also with foodborne pathogens. And I'm going to give a look, uh, some examples from these different topics. In the food safety, in the US, there's uh, 48 million foodborne illnesses that occur each year. 
from those, about 12% are related to fresh produce, leads to 128,000 hospitalizations, 2,500 illnesses caused by listeria, uh, 3,000 deaths every year associated with foodborne illnesses, okay? Bacteria or virus or protozoa that makes it into our food. So preventing foodborne illnesses and death is still a major um, public health challenge in the US. These are some of the major outbreaks that have happened in the last 10 years. Some of them have involved death of people, some of them has resulted in hospitalizations, and a lot of them has caused great damage to the industry. Because one of the things that happen when you have an outbreak is your reputation as a company is affected. Some cases you cannot recover from that, um, from, from what happened with a foodborne illness associated with your, um, with your company. So we're still having, in 2013, this year, we already have outbreaks associated with salmonella and with the enterohemorrhagic E. coli. So it's still a major issue that we need to get better tools to predict. We have been working on this using infrared spectroscopy. We have developed a very simple method that is associated with a hydrophobic grid. This is a technique that is fairly used by microbiologists for enumerating um, colonies. What we're doing is we're using this filtration device. This, um, this membrane has very small, each one of these squares is, is surrounded by a hydrophobic material. It's a line that is hydrophobic. So if our cell falls in one of these uh, squares, it will stay there. So it filters, we have cells. In theory, we should have one cell per square. And then we take this, we put it in, a, in an agar, a nutrient agar, and then we grow it. Usually, in our case, we were growing it between 24, it's about 24 hours that we were using. 